Hello, my friends. My name is James and welcome to this beginner JavaScript course. Now I'm super excited to have this course live on the channel because not so long ago I was in the same shoes as you. I had to teach myself JavaScript. I was interested in the programming language and it was really challenging. And ever since then, I have wanted to craft the ultimate curriculum that we can go through that teaches you all the foundational material concepts, knowledge that you need to eventually become a JavaScript pro. I've spent absolutely ages finessing the material that we're going to be covering in this Get Started with JavaScript course. It should be loads of fun, super interesting, and it doesn't matter if you have absolutely no experience with JavaScript before, we're going to start from the very beginning and should you stick with it till the end, you will feel confident and comfortable inside of the JavaScript ecosystem, coding JavaScript, whipping up all sorts of cool applications, deploying them live to the internet, and ultimately, if you build a good foundation, it just makes learning everything else infinitely easier. There is absolutely loads to JavaScript and by no means do we cover all of it in this course. If you enjoy the course, this is just an introductory part of it. There is a full course linked in the description down below that you could really go and get your hands dirty with. Now, before we dive into the material, there's a few things you should know. First and foremost is that there is to be no note taking in this course. I'd much prefer that you listen, engage, participate and code along. But if you still want a handy set of notes to keep available, I have prepared one for you. Linked in the description down below is a comprehensive set of JavaScript notes that you can access at any time. It covers everything we will cover in this course and a whole lot more. So if you want to go the extra mile, you can get your hands dirty with those notes. Furthermore, what do you do if you have any questions, qualms or queries? Well, in this course, we're going to be downloading a JavaScript file from a GitHub repo linked in the description down below. This repo, this JavaScript file contains the curriculum that we're going to be working through. So you can check that out if you want. Now, at the same time in the GitHub repo, you can access the issues tab. And if you have any questions, you can just leave them there and either myself or someone else will come and answer any questions, qualms or queries you may have. So that's absolutely wicked. And last but not least, I hope you have a lot of fun in this get started with JavaScript course. We should absolutely rip through it. It covers all the foundational stuff. And by the end, you know, you'll be pretty competent coding in JavaScript. There's obviously loads of extra material. This is the 20% that does 80% of the leg work. But once again, if you do want to really get the ultimate JavaScript skill set, then be sure to check out the full course linked in the description down below. Loads of people have gone through it. Everyone has a great time. And so if that's something you're interested, in, then be sure to check that out. Anywho, that's enough of me rambling on. It's time to get into the material. And as always, if you enjoy, don't forget to smash the like and subscribe button so that I can continue to feed Doug a healthy diet. And now it is time for us to officially get started learning JavaScript. And the first thing we're going to cover is a little bit about the JavaScript ecosystem and how we can actually get set up to code JavaScript on our computer. Now, if you've already run a JavaScript file on your computer and you're just looking to brush up on some of the foundational material, then I would advise skipping forward to chapter one. In chapter zero, we're just going to be learning a bit about JavaScript in the big picture. And also, as I said earlier, getting configured on our device to execute and run JavaScript. Timestamps are linked in the description down below. Now, for those of you who have not skipped ahead and have never run a JavaScript file on your computer ever before, it's time for a little bit of theory. And we're going to be answering the question, what is JavaScript and how does it work? Now, when we're talking about programming languages, the way that I like to think about them is as a recipe where a recipe is used for cooking. We follow a set of instructions and basically that produces food. Well, a programming language such as JavaScript is not too dissimilar. Over here, what we do is we create a JavaScript file. Now this is referred to as a script, but in this analogy, we're going to refer to it as a recipe. And all we do is we write out a bunch of instructions in the form of lines of code that are written using the syntax called JavaScript. Now, obviously with a recipe, we write it out in English. English has a syntax and JavaScript is not too dissimilar, except where a recipe is read by 
this handsome fella with a whole lot of curly hair up here. JavaScript is a recipe that is read by the computer. More specifically, something known as a JavaScript runtime. A JavaScript runtime simply is trained to read JavaScript, execute the instructions, and produce an output. In this case, we're going to be using the JavaScript runtime known as Node.js, and I'm going to show you how to set that up on your computer in a minute. But essentially, to write and execute JavaScript, we need to code out a set of instructions written using the JavaScript programming language, and then have a runtime that can then read and execute, basically go and you know, follow our instructions. Furthermore, to code out JavaScript, we're going to need what is known as an IDE, or a developer environment. In this case, I'm using Visual Studio Code, which is the most popular choice for developers. Now, the installation links for both the Node.js JavaScript runtime and Visual Studio Code are in the description down below. And first, what we're going to do is come over to codevisualstudio.com, hit this download button right here, it's going to prompt you to install VS Code. Go ahead and complete that. And once you've installed it on your device, you should be able to open up a VS Code window that vaguely resembles this. It might look a little bit different. The theme might be a bit different as well. That's okay for the minute. And once you've done that, we're going to come back to the second installation link where we're going to install the JavaScript runtime known as Node.js. Now, once again, this is linked in the description down below. You'll just want to hit install and once that is downloaded on your device, we can test that it's installed from within Visual Studio Code. Now, if you've just opened up Visual Studio Code for the very first time, you might have a window that looks a bit more like this than the one I had up before. And what we're going to do in here is we're going to start off by opening up our folder where we're going to create our project. Inside of here, what we're going to do is come over or create a folder. I have a folder where I keep all of my uh, JavaScript where I keep all my coding projects and in here you're going to create a new folder I already have one and then you're just going to select the open button which is behind my head right here and when you hit open that's essentially just going to open up the folder directory inside of VS Code now when you first come in here you might have this Explorer window on the side if you don't you can open and close it using this tab and it might be completely empty and that is totally okay and over on the right hand side here, this is where we'll eventually be writing out all of our JavaScript. Now at the minute, our Explorer is pretty much empty. We have a readme.md and the .git attributes. These are specific to my version and they're related to me storing this code on GitHub, which is how you can go and download it and compare it yours to mine at any point. But what we're going to do first is start off by creating a JavaScript file. Now there's a few ways you can do that. First and foremost is we've got this little uh, plus file here that gives you the option to create a file. Equally, you can right click and go new file. And in here, we're going to create a file called index dot, then we add the extension, the file extension. And for a JavaScript file, that's dot JS or dot JavaScript. So that opens up this file for us. It's totally blank. And in here is where we can eventually write out all of our code. This is not happy JavaScript at the minute, so we get a whole lot of red underlines. But at this point, we now need to confirm that Node.js is installed on our device. And to do that, we're going to have to open up a terminal instance. Now you can do this from the file options. I have the ability to create a select terminal and then go new terminal. Or what you can do is you can go control and then hit the back tick key, which is typically adjacent to the one key control and back tick and just like that that pops up this terminal uh, just down here that we can then go and run some commands from so i'm going to remove all the content in our javascript file make sure i save it and what we're going to do now is take a look at the terminal so there's a few things we can see in here first and foremost is it tells us what directory we're in it tells us what device we're on this is my mac uh, and we're in the folder directory JavaScript for beginners. We can confirm that because we are inside of this folder in our Explorer. Now in here, to confirm that node is working, we're going to need to type the command node space dash V. If we hit enter on that, 
Node will return a version. I have version 20 installed. It doesn't matter what version you have installed. It's absolutely fine. But the point of doing this is that if Node has not been installed correctly, you'll get a big fat error showing up and it won't look very happy. So that's just a way that we can confirm Node, the JavaScript runtime that we'll need to execute our JavaScript files is in fact installed on your device. So that is relatively straightforward. Now the next thing we're going to do is come over to the GitHub link for the repo. It's in the description down below. This is just my profile. I'm doing it the hard way. And we're going to look for the JavaScript for beginners repo. Now in here, you'll see a couple of files. There's the curriculum.javascript. This is going to be completed in this tutorial you'll want to code along. And there's also a curriculum underscore template. Now this is a file. If you select it, what you'll need to do is download the raw file into our folder directory. So I'm going to come over to my folders in here, JavaScript for beginners, and I'm going to save this curriculum template. Now, if we come back over to our project directory, here we can see the curriculum template is in fact saved in our folder. We can open it up and here we have a file that has the curriculum that we're going to follow inside of this tutorial. Now at this point, I'm going to go ahead and delete the index.javascript and I'm going to rename this to be simply curriculum.javascript. If you are in the GitHub repo, be sure to leave a star. It's super appreciated. It helps to support the channel. Greatly appreciated. Anywho, back to our JavaScript file. So now that we have this curriculum.javascript file available to us inside of our Explorer and we can open that up, we're going to jump into the second chapter, which is node commands in the terminal. We've already seen one here, but the ones that we need to focus on allow us to a run a JavaScript file, get the, get the runtime node.js to actually read and execute the file. And the second one is to kill the execution. Sometimes if you end up getting in an infinite loop, your code doesn't want to stop running. How can you exit out of that? We've also completed chapter one, which is explaining a little bit about JavaScript and making sure that we've installed everything we need on our device to successfully complete this tutorial and become JavaScript pros. Now, the first thing we're going to do together is learn how we can execute a JavaScript file. And it's actually relatively straightforward. All we have to do is come into our terminal and get node. We access node, tell node we're going to do something. And then we just give it the name of the file that we want to run. So in this case, we would say curriculum.javascript. Now, one thing you want to do is make sure your files are always saved every time you go and rerun them. Node will rerun the latest saved version. So if you forget to save it, your new code will not be executed. Now with that command entered, I can hit enter and that's going to execute the file. This file doesn't currently do anything except specify a curriculum. So there was no output produced. There was nothing really done. But the point is, is that we didn't get any errors and that is successfully executed our Java script. Now, the second thing we need to know how to do is if you ever get a problem where your terminal is not stopping running the file or you have a bug, use the control and C keys at the same time. Here I'm hitting them and every time what it's doing is it's exiting the current, you know, execution and it's giving us access to a new one. So that's pretty handy and it's good to remember control plus C is used for killing a file. Basically, it doesn't delete the file. It just ends the execution of that file. So that's everything we need to know about node commands for this tutorial. Absolutely covered. Pretty straightforward. Props to you. Now on to the actual JavaScript content. And at this point, if you did skip ahead and you're just joining us now to dive into the JavaScript section of the course, all you'll need to do to catch up is download this curriculum underscore template dot JavaScript file from the GitHub repo linked in the description down below. Equally, you can create a completely blank file, but this just has the curriculum that we're going to be working through in this tutorial. So it's time to get our hands dirty with the first JavaScript centric chapter in this course. And the first thing we're going to do inside this section is actually a bit of a rite of passage when you're learning to code. We're going to create a simple instruction where when we execute it, our terminal 
our JavaScript runtime is going to speak back to us and print out the, the, the phrase hello world. Now in JavaScript, this is a super useful thing to know how to do. It's the first thing people often learn how to do is basically get your instructions to talk to you or print out some information. And inside JavaScript, we do that using what's known as the console and then dot log. Now the terminal is also referred to as the console. And all we're doing is we're logging to the console. So whatever we log to the console gets spit out and basically printed in here. And we'll see how that works in just a second. Now at the end of console.log, if you've written that out inside your file, you have to add on these circular parentheses. Now we'll learn all about what this means later. For now, we're just doing this little rite of passage. And whatever we enter inside of these circular parentheses is what gets printed out inside of our console or logged to our console. Now you might think we just go ahead and write out hello world. I want to have hello world printed to my console or logged to my console. However, we can see that's now given us a squiggly underline, which means that our JavaScript runtime doesn't understand what's being written here. We've broken the code. And if we go ahead and run node space curriculum dot JavaScript, we can see that nothing happens. And there's a few reasons that has uh, occurred. First, every time we want to make adjustments to our code base, we have to save the file. That's super important. If you make a change and it's unsaved, you'll typically see it as a little dot up there. We have to save the file. And now if I go ahead and run that command again, we can scroll through previous commands using the up and down arrows. So I'm going to get it to automatically show up by using the up arrow. If I go ahead and run this, we get a whole error just here. And it's telling us that we have a syntax error, which essentially says that the runtime has no idea what we've written. So this is a case where we have written English, which isn't JavaScript. Now inside of JavaScript, when we want to write out a sentence or any, you know, set of characters in a form that's interpretable by a human, we have to use a data type for that. And the data type specifically for this use case is known as a string. Now a string represents a string of characters, which as I said earlier, is basically a sentence. And we create that in JavaScript by writing out our sentence in between either the single or double quotation marks. Now we can see that the uh, red squiggly underline has gone away and suddenly JavaScript knows to recognize this hello world. It's inside the single or double quotation marks as a string. And so now what I can do is I can go ahead and rerun this command and we can see that our terminal did in fact print out hello world. So that's absolutely brilliant. That is your rite of passage. Now, as I said earlier, you can compare your code to mine at any point in this tutorial. Once again, I've changed the file names just for clarity. You should have downloaded the template originally, but my completed version is going to be inside the curriculum.javascript file. So if you check that, you'll see everything I've done in there. So that is our little rite of passage. We've gone ahead and we have executed this line right here, which means we've logged a string containing the characters hello world and we've logged that to our console which means that it's printed it out and we can see it now the next thing we're going to do is touch on a variable that's what this chapter is all about and variables are super important inside of javascript for storing information now obviously right here we have a string that says hello world but what if we need that string a whole lot of times, we need that sentence very often. Is there a way that we can save ourselves from continually writing it out? Well, we absolutely can. We do that by assigning it to what's known as a variable. So in this case, I could have a variable called my sentence. Now, there's a few rules when you create variables. 
The first is that you cannot have a space inside of your variable that doesn't exist. It's just going to confuse it and it becomes too much like English. You're leaving JavaScript behind. So instead of having spaces inside of JavaScript, we use what's known as either camel case or snake case. Now camel case is where we basically create variables and make them look like camels. Essentially how that works is instead of having a space to separate our words, every new word is instead capitalized. So in here I could say my sentence is very cool and that would be a safe variable name because we don't have any spaces and we can distinguish where a word starts and ends because it's capitalized and those humps create the, you know, the camel case. The other way we can create variables, it's best if they're quite explicit because that just means that your code is very readable for absolutely anyone, is by using uh, the snake case syntax. Instead of using the uppercase or a space, we instead use a, a, uh, the underscore. So in this case, we would say my underscore sentence uh, underscore is very cool. Now, typically each programmer has a preference. You can pick which is preferable for you. I'm going to be using camel case in this course. It's best if you stick to one and don't uh, muddle them up, mix them up because then it just becomes confusing for everyone. Now I've created a variable. It's called my sentence. And this is basically a shorthand where if I refer to it in future inside of our instructions, I can then uh, access the value assigned or associated with that variable. So an example, if we were creating a recipe, let's say we had a variable called number of eggs. And let's say that's equal to four. So what I've done here is I've got the value four, that's the number of eggs, and I've used the equal assignment operator, and I've then assigned that value to number of eggs. So what I could do later is I could console log, which if you recall, logs to the console, and I could console.log number of eggs. And what this means is that I can then at any point in my code access this value assigned to this variable and use it in a million different ways. I could console the value of number of eggs and then I could add onto it six more. So learning to assign values to variables is a very important skill inside of JavaScript. Now what we've done here isn't actually quite complete. When you use a variable inside of JavaScript, you can just write it out as we have here. I've referred to it using number of eggs and that is totally fine. But when we define a variable, when we use it for the very first time, when we initialize it, the first time here I'm initializing the variable number of eggs, we have to instantiate it using a declaration. Essentially how that works is we declare to JavaScript that we are creating a variable and we can do that using one of two declarations. The first one makes you sound like a fancy mathematician. You know, you could say let the value of x equal to 4 or let the value of number of eggs equal to 4. Kind of like maths. Now when we use the let declaration to initialize a variable that means that at a later stage, we can reassign a new value to that variable. For example, right here, I could say let number of eggs equal to six, except I don't have to redeclare it because we've already declared it once. I can now just assign a new value to number of eggs. And so what happens here is I've defined or initialized the variable using the let keyword. I've assigned the value of four to it. Then when my runtime comes down, it reads the new instruction. And we've now assigned the value of six to the variable. And then when I log it to the console, it's going to get the value of six. It's going to add six to it. And it's going to output 12 to my terminal. It's not going to output 10 because we've overwritten the original value which we can do because we've used the let keyword. Now the second keyword or declaration that we can use is known as const, short for constant. And that means that it has a constant value. 
And so what that means is that I am not allowed to reassign new values using the equal or assignment operator. This would break my code and make it exceptionally unhappy. So understanding which declaration to use to initialize or instantiate your variables is super important. So just up here, we have a variable called my sentence, and we can see it's the first time that we're using it, which means that we need to initialize it or declare that it's going to be a variable. So what we would do in here is use the const declaration because the value is not going to change. And now what I can do is I can copy that in there as my sentence. And in this case, I can't interchange this like so. I couldn't replace my sentence up there because JavaScript reads down the page. So essentially we would have to declare it before we then go and access it later. So I can leave it like this, but in this case, what I could do is I could comma separate and add a second output down here to my console.log. You can comma separate outputs uh, inside of your console log inside the circular parentheses. And now what it's going to do is it's going to refetch uh, my variable, access the value associated with the variable and print that out, saving me from rewriting the sentence. So that's a little bit about variables. I'm going to change this one to a let so that we have an example of both of them being used. And I might actually uh, keep that example just like that to show that let allows us to reassign. So we could make a little note there saying let declaration allows us to reassign a new value comma const does not. So the next thing on our curriculum of things to learn is a code comment. Now, sometimes when we're writing JavaScript, JavaScript is known as a high level language, which means that it's a bit of a halfway point between what a program or a computer needs to read and what a human needs to read. So obviously here, if you read this JavaScript, you can figure out that, okay, we've got four regs. It's pretty intelligible. Yet in some cases, code can still look like absolute jargon. And so what we do instead to add clarity is we literally write out the English language. For example, you might have wondered how I have all this English here. That's clearly not JavaScript, yet it didn't pull up an error when we went to execute the file. And that's because all these lines of code here are commented out. What that means is that they're English comments, they're not for the computer to read and the computer or the JavaScript runtime understands that. And the way that we create a comment inside of JavaScript, for example, I could write out, this is a comment that's not happy. That's just English. The JavaScript, is, the JavaScript runtime will try to read it and be unhappy about it. But now what I can do is at the start of any line that I want to be commented out, I can add the double forward slash, and now that line is invisible to our JavaScript runtime. It's just for humans to read. So leaving code comments is an absolutely brilliant practice because it means that you can add descriptions, you can add explanations, you can add notes to anybody who's reading your bodies of code. And it just adds a whole lot of clarity. So it's very important to know how to leave comments inside of JavaScript. Typically the syntax for code comments varies between programming languages, but it's typically pretty easy to pick up. Now the last thing I want to talk about inside of this variable section is what's known as assignment by reference. So let's say down here, I have let new number of eggs, and that's a variable that I'm creating. And let's say, let number of eggs is always going to be the exact same as the old number of eggs. But here I've assigned a value of four and then I've overwritten it to six. And I just want it to be whatever is the last thing that I assigned to number of eggs. So instead of assigning a new value of six to get that to match, what I could do is I could assign by reference where we reference a previous variable and access the value associated with this variable. So this code right here is what's known as an assignment by reference instead of assignment by value. And that just is going to match uh, the two variables together, essentially. 
So now it's time we move on to the next chapter, which is all about data types. And we've currently covered two of them, but in this section, we'll cover them in a little bit more detail. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about before we actually dive into the specificities of data types, it's important to know that there's a few main operations that we can use for each of them. The first is initializing. Up here, we've seen an example of how we can initialize a variable and assign a value, which is a valid data type. Now, basically everything inside of JavaScript needs to be a valid data type. It's either a variable or it's a value and the values are all one of many different types of data types. The data types are what is safe for JavaScript to read. Here's an example. We're going to learn how we can read, initialize and write all of these data types. Now the initialization refers to how we can create a, da a data type for the first time. For example, up here, we saw how we can create a string. The read example refers to how we can read a string. In this case, we've accessed the value of my sentence later. This changes for different data types, as we will see. And the last example is how we can write to or modify the existing value of the string. Once again, that looks different for the different data types that we will be covering. So first up on our list just here is the string data type. Now I'm going to create some spaces underneath here by typing enter. And what I'm also going to do is remember to save my JavaScript file regularly, even though we're not running it at the moment. Now, as we saw earlier, we create a string by writing out a sentence. Hello, my name is James. And then what we have to do is make sure we wrap it in either the single or the double quotation. That is a safe data type. If I just leave the string here, it does absolutely nothing. JavaScript just reads it as a string, but no further action is taken. I could assign it to a variable and say, let sentence is equal to that particular string. And now that string is assigned to a variable sentence that I can access later in my code. Also, what I could do is I could just console.log the string, and then it's just going to be logged to the console or printed out down here. So if I go ahead and save this and run our file using the node space curriculum.js file, we can see that up here, we console out the hello world line. So that's the top print right there. Then we console.log the number of eggs plus six. So that gives us 12. We print out the sentence again, which is hello world. And then we finally console.log this last line, which is hello, my name is James. So that's all relatively straightforward. Now, if I just come back a second, let's go back to the example where I assign it to a variable. One thing that is important to note inside of JavaScript is that you cannot declare a variable twice. So up here, I've declared a variable called const my sentence. Down here, I'm trying to instantiate it using a, the let declaration again, and it's giving me an underline. It's saying that's not happy, and that's because you cannot declare the same variable name twice. So sentence would be fine, but my sentence would not be. So that's just something important to keep in mind is that you can only initialize a variable once. So here we have a string. I'm going to call this let my string equal to hello, my name is James. Now that's how we can initialize a string. How can we go about reading it? Well, the example I'm going to use to read a string is actually to at the same time write a string. I'm going to create a variable called extended string. And what I'm going to do is read the value of my string. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to concatenate or add to it. I'm going to string together strings. Now the plus is obviously something we recognize from maths. We add two values together. String concatenation is pretty equivalent. We take the first string and we just add on some new characters, for example, a period. And I like the color blue. So now we're going to take the value associated with this variable, my string, and then we're going to add on the secondary string right here, and that's going to extend the string. 
Now that's one example of reading and writing to the string. And it's important to know that every character in the string is indexed. And indexing basically is like a library. You index all of the books and each index keeps track of the location of each entry element character in this case of a string. So the way that we, let's say for example, access the value at a particular index in a string, we could log out. I'm using the console.log because I want the JavaScript runtime to spit out or print out whatever it's reading. And in here, I'm going to access my string and then to get a value at a particular index, let's say for example, I just wanted to see what the character in the fifth position was. What I could do is use the square braces. The square braces are always used for indexing. And that's saying access my string. And then in here, what I do is I pass in the index that I want to read. Now, indexing in JavaScript starts off at zero instead of one. So this might be the fifth position in your eyes, but it's not in JavaScript. JavaScript starts off with the zeroth position. Then the first position is the E. The second position is the L, the third position is the L, and the fourth position is the O. So in this case, if I access the fourth index, let's see what the console, let's see what gets logged to the console. In this case, we can see the O is what gets logged to the console. So that's just good to be aware of, that we can read the values at particular indexes in our string. Now the next data type we're going to look at is the number. Now the number is pretty straightforward. Here we can say const favorite number, which is declaring a variable called favorite number, and we can assign the value of 83. Now JavaScript is pretty clever. It sees numbers as we see numbers. So I can just write 83. It doesn't need to be a string. Numbers are safe. Obviously if you tried to add commas, that would confuse it. So just no commas and you can have numbers, you can add numbers. And if you're wondering, the reason 83 is my favorite number is because, and you might not believe me when I first say this, but three is actually half of eight. Most people think it's four and technically that's also correct, but it depends how you define a half. If you split this eight smack bang down the middle, if you halve it in a literal sense, you get the the value three. So that's my favorite number. And it is assigned to the variable favorite number, which is a const declaration, which means that this is permanent. We ain't assigning no new numbers to this variable. Next up on our list, a valid data type is known as an array. Now an array is best thought of as a list of entries. If you think about writing a list, let's say you're going to the supermarket, each line is an element in that list. You could even think about each line as being a string. You've got a whole lot of strings in a vertical list orientation. An array is pretty much the same thing, but in JavaScript. For example, I could define a variable called const grocery list, just like that. Now at this point, I might just mention one other benefit of variables is obviously they give clarity to what a lot of the data that we have inside of our JavaScript actually is. For example, I could just write out a list, but if I don't assign it to a variable, I might not know what that means. Whereas having the variable grocery list means that it's obviously the grocery list. Now to create the array data type or the list data type inside of JavaScript, we use the square braces. Now, obviously up here, the square braces are used for reading values, but when we instantiate them by themselves, it creates the array data type. Now in here, I could have a list of numbers. For example, I could have one. Now, if we wanna have multiple elements or entries in our list, we have to comma separate them. So I could have one, two, three, four, and five, and then six, and that is a list of values. Obviously it's written across the page instead of down the list on your grocery list, but just as equally, I can enter them onto new lines and format it. And we still have a happy array or a happy JavaScript list. Now at the same time, this could literally be a grocery list. 
each entry as a string. Let's say I need eggs, comma separate it, then I need bananas, uh, comma separate it, and then I need bread. And so just like that, we have literally created a list, which is also known as an array inside of JavaScript. Now this array has a length of three. There are three entries. This is the zeroth index. Remember everything in JavaScript is zeroth indexed. This is the first index and this is the second index or the third entry. Now with arrays, there's lots of reading and writing that can go on. Here is a const declaration, which means that if I wanted to change the list, I couldn't say grocery list is now equal to just bananas and bread. That doesn't work because I'm assigning a new array to a variable that I defined using the const declaration and that's illegal, cannot be done. So instead, if I wanted to read or write to specific indexes in the array, for example, this is the zeroth index, I can read it in a similar way that I read values from the string. So I can read the value at the zeroth index. Now lists, the way that they're indexed is using numeric values. Once again, just like the string, this is the zeroth index, this is the first index, and this is the second index. So what I could do now is console.log the value at the zeroth index of our list. Now, if I go ahead and execute our JavaScript file, we can see that it logs to the console the value eggs. If I access the first value, then we very simply get back the, the value or the string at the first index. Now, we can take this a step further, and what I could do just here is I can write to that index. I could say grocery list at the first index, and let's say I wanted to correct that spelling error or actually assign a new fruit. Let's say I wanted to have kiwi fruit. Now strings can obviously have spaces because it's a sent because JavaScript knows it's a safe sentence. But essentially what this is doing is instead of rewriting the array, I can now modify a particular index inside that array and I can write a new value to that index. So the first index right here has currently got a value or a string of bananas. Now what I'm doing is instead of just reading it, I'm first writing the string kiwi fruit to that value, assigning it there, it's going to overwrite that. And now when we log out that value, we'll see that it prints kiwi fruit. So there's a load of cool stuff you can do. Here we're reading the value at the first index, here we're writing and we're creating a list. Now we started off creating a list with numbers, list can have any valid data type. For example, I could have an 83, comma separating all the values. I could have a list that is inside a list, that is inside a list, that is inside a list, that is inside a list. Now that becomes very confusing to work with and these are called nested lists, lists within lists arrays within arrays but the point remains it's relatively straightforward you just have to have a valid data type as an entry for your array now the next data type on the list is known as an object or a dictionary and it's actually not that dissimilar from the array the array was defined using these square parentheses the object is defined using the curly parentheses, not the circular, but the curly parentheses. And essentially how an object works is that it's actually, you know, this is where it gets the name dictionary from. We could define a variable called dictionary, set it equal to the curly braces. I like to open them up on new lines so that I have space to work in here. And where an array has a whole lot of values that are indexed by their place in the array, a dictionary has a whole lot of values that are indexed by a key. Now we can think of it literally like a dictionary. For example, I could have the key, uh, what's a good word? Uh, the ocean. If we were looking up and we wanted to know what the definition of an ocean was, we would look up the O key, the ocean key, find the word in the dictionary, and the value associated with that key ocean is the definition. 
So in here, I could have a body of water, you know, between countries or whatever the actual definition is. Now, inside of a dictionary, this is referred to as a key value pair. Here we have the value, which is a valid data type. The key actually doesn't have to be a string. It could literally just be written ocean like that, kind of like a variable, but we don't have to declare it. And every key has an associated value and that makes them a key value pair. Where we separate the key from the value with the use of the semicolon character. And as I've said, we comma separate key value pairs within the dictionary object, within the opening and closing curly braces. So I could have a second key that's the C and assign the value which is a string data type that contains the definition of a C, a different body of water. That's how I know how to distinguish them. I could also have in here my favorite number and assign the value 83. And that's just another key value pair. Obviously it's a bit convoluted because it doesn't make sense in the context of our dictionary. But the point is, is that it's just a whole lot of values where instead of looking them up with an index, we use a key to keep track of everything. That creates the key value pair. A good example would be const user. The user is an object where they have a name. My name is James and they have a password which it, I'm not going to tell you my password, a whole lot of asterisks. That's my password. This is a good use for a dictionary. And then what we can do is we can look up values inside of our dictionary. I could log to the console, the user. And just like when we read from an array, we read from a string, we use the square parentheses to look something up. And instead, now we just access the key. Now, in this case, the key does have to be a string, which I know is a bit confusing, but I'll show you why shortly. But in this case, what it's going to do is it's going to look up the key called name, and it's going to access the value associated with that key inside of the dictionary. In this case, it's going to print out, you guessed it, James. Now, if I didn't, for example, use the string data type to look up that key and instead looked up dictionary, for example, I wanted to find the value associated with the key dictionary, which does not exist in here. Instead, what JavaScript is actually going to do is read this as a variable that it then has to go and find the associated value. And it becomes all very confusing because the value it's going to find is a different dictionary, which it can't look up as a key. So the whole thing isn't very clear. It's best if you just use the uh, string in here when you're defining what key it is that you want to look up. Now, if I were to look up the dictionary key inside of my user dictionary, or my user object, it wouldn't find anything. And so it just returns undefined. It cannot be found. Now, one important thing to know about dictionaries is that we can actually look up values using a separate syntax. It's called the dot notation, where instead of using the square parentheses and the string name, we can just have dot name. Now, in this case, it's not going to treat that as a variable. It's actually going to see it as a valid key. And it's going to look up the key name inside of the user object. And that will also console name. Now what I could do just so we could demonstrate both uh, syntaxes is I could have name square brackets password. And that is going to actually need to be user not name. And if I go ahead and run that, we can see that now the uh, name is consoled and the password is consoled using the two different syntaxes for reading inside of an object. Now, as you might expect, just as we saw in the array example, writing is not too dissimilar. What I could do down here, if I had some new values, instead of rewriting out the whole dictionary, I could just say user dot name is equal to and assign a new valid data type or a value to that key it becomes the new value associated with that key and consequently the new key value pair. 
For example, I could have Elias. Now the user.name or the name key, the value associated with that becomes Elias. And I could have a new user password. I can use the syntax right here. You can use one or the other. And it's just gonna be four of the asterisks. Now what I could do is I could console.log the entire user dictionary. And what's going to happen here is we print out, just like we did before, the original user.name, which is James, and the eight asterisks. Then we overwrite the values assigned with the name and password keys to these new strings right here. We console out the entire dictionary and we can see that it has in fact been updated to represent the modifications made to that dictionary. So that's an example of how we can read and write from the object or dictionary data type. So now that we've learned a little bit about objects, it's time to move on to the next data type, which is the null data type. Now null represents the absence of information. So if we were defining a variable, for example, const unknown number is equal to, but we don't know what the number is, we could assign the data type or value of null, which just basically leaves it as a blank space, except if we were to just write code like this and have it empty, you know, JavaScript would be extremely unhappy. So there's a data type to represent the absence of information known as null. Now that one is super straightforward. Uh, and the next one is actually very similar and it's known as the undefined data type. So it's slightly different to an absence of information. It's just saying that the information is undefined. There are nuanced differences between the two of them, but we could just have an undefined value and that is equal to undefined. And that's literally all you have to do to initialize something and set it equal to an undefined amount. I could now console.log unknown number and undefined value, and I can come down into my terminal and execute this file, node space curriculum.javascript, hit enter there, and we can see that it literally just prints out null and undefined. So that's super straightforward, and it leaves us with one last data type that we need to be familiar with, and that is known as the Boolean. Now, Boolean is my absolute favorite word. It's super fun to say, and it represents what is known as either a true or false value. So I could have a variable, const is James cool, and that is obviously equal to true. Leave a comment down below if you disagree, I dare you to. Uh, equally, what we could do is say, const or let we can declare another variable called let is uh, cabbage delicious and that's obviously equal to false i'm not a big cabbage uh, fan it's not my personal preference but these are both uh, valid data types they are boolean data types and they represent either a truthy or a falsy uh, statement now, Boolean data types are really important when we start to look at logic inside of JavaScript, which is a super important concept. It's super simple to wrap your head around, and we'll touch on it a little bit later. But for now, it's good to know that we just have these uh, Boolean data types. And with that all done, it's time to jump into a recap. And the first thing I just want to talk about is data types. The whole purpose of data types is that we have different types of data that we can manipulate and modify inside of JavaScript. And everything basically has to be written as a valid data type. Now for our recap, what I'm gonna do is access the notes. These are linked in the description down below. We're looking for the JavaScript notes. And as I said earlier, these cover all the material that is available to you in this course and a whole lot more. Now, the first stuff we're gonna just quickly recap on is the runtime where the runtime no JS in this case literally just reads executes and interprets our JavaScript files the next thing we need to know is creating a JavaScript file all we do is create a file inside of VS code and give it the dot JavaScript file extension 
here we have the console.log hello world. That's super important because it allows us to log information to the console, which is also known as the terminal. And whatever we pass in as an argument inside of these circular parentheses, in this case, we have the hello world as a string it's surrounded by the quotation marks that makes it a string. And then we can go ahead and execute the file. In this case, the file is called index.javascript and that's going to output console.log. Also, make sure you save your files so that the adjustments are included in your re-execution. Now, after that, we're going to touch on variables. In JavaScript, we have two primary variables. There's actually a third one called var, but we don't touch that. That's icky and gross. The first one is const. Now, declarations declare the use of a variable where we assign a value to be associated or stored under that variable name. It's like having a box. We put some information in the box and we slap a label on it. The label is the variable and whatever is inside the box is the value associated with that variable. So when I go to the garage and look for a box that's titled taxes, I know inside there I have my tax information. Now the first declaration that we can use is const. We declare the variable the first time we use it and const is used to initialize a variable when we can guarantee that the value will never change. On the other hand, we have the second declaration, which is let, and that's used to initialize a variable when the value is likely to change or if we are uncertain as to how permanent its value will be. For example, in this case, we could say let x equal five and then later reassign x equals to seven. We also learn that the variable names themselves cannot have spaces in them. They also can't have dashes. And another piece of information is that they also can't start with a number. They have to start with a letter of the alphabet. And when we have multi-word variable names, we either use the camel case or we use the snake case where the camel case capitalizes the first letter of each word, whereas snake case uh, uses an underscore in place of the space. So here we could define the variable first name and assign it the string John to that variable. In this case, we've used camel case. And in this case, we've used the snake case. Now, after that, we have the data types. And here are some of the common ones. We've got the number pretty straightforward. It's just a number. After that, we have a string. The string contains a string of characters, also known as a sentence where the characters are encapsulated within the single or double quotation marks. After that, we had the array. The array is just a special type of list where we comma separate every value in the array where the values all have to be valid data types. Similarly, we have the object. The object, also known as a dictionary, uses a key to look up a value. Just like we go to a dictionary, we look up a word. We might look up banana. It tells us what the banana is. We looked up the key banana to find the value, which is the definition associated with that key. In this case, we could have the key name and the value is the string John. We could have the key age and we could have a value of 30, which is the number data type. I could look up what the key inside the dictionary is. I could look up what the age is and it would return the value of 30. After that, we covered null. It's the absence of a value undefined, which represents the absence of a value due to not being assigned yet or a reference pointing to nowhere. And then we have the Boolean, which is either true or false. So that was just a quick little recap. Everything will continue to become more solid as we practice more throughout this course. So next up on our list is logic and operators. Now logic and operators are loads of fun. You're probably already familiar with a lot of them. So that's super straightforward. For example, I could say uh, const sum is equal to three plus nine. Uh, and so sum, if I were to console.log sum, what I could actually do is I could console.log the string sum, and then I could console uh, comma separate the actual value. So now when I go to re-execute my code, here we can see that we've actually had some text formatting done. This can help make your console.logs more meaningful. In this case, we can 
rest assured that the sum is associated with the value 12, 3 plus 9. So in that case, we use the plus operator. Obviously, we have the minus divide operators as well, and we also have a remainder operator. Now, if we were to say const division is equal to 12 divided by 5, you know, what is that going to be equal to? In this case, let's find out division uh, colon comma, and then we can have the uh, we can see what the actual value associated with the variable decision is uh, division is. So in that case, we can see it's 2.4. Now the remainder is more interesting. So in this case, if we had remainder, we initialize a variable called remainder and it's 12 remainder five where the remainder operator is the percent sign. If we now were to uh, log the remainder, we would see that that has a value of, let's find out, rerun the code. It has a remainder of two, which means that in the division of 12 divided by five, we get basically five going into 12 twice. And then we have two, an awkward two left over, which in the division gives us the point four. But in this case, we return the remainder. So the leftover of two of this operation is what ends up being assigned to the remainder. Now remainders can be incredibly helpful. For example, if we were trying to figure out whether or not a value was even, I could say const is even is equal to 12 remainder two. Now what this is going to do is it's going to divide two into 12 and see if we get a leftover of either one or zero. In this case, we get a leftover of zero, which means that the, you know, if it's divisible by two, it has to be even. If we had a remainder of one, then we could conclude that it was odd. So it's just an operator that's super useful to be aware of that as you progress throughout your JavaScript journey, you will become more and more aware of. Now those are the basic operators. After that, we have the logical operators. And in this case, we have two, one is or and one is and. Now what I'm actually gonna do for the logical operator section is jump a little bit ahead of my code down to conditional statements, because we're going to learn the logical operators through the context of what's known as a conditional statement. So we're gonna jump ahead for two seconds before we then jump back. And what we're now going to learn about is what's known as the if else block. So, so far in our JavaScript file, whenever I've been running code or running the script telling Node to execute our JavaScript file, every line of code gets processed with exception to the code comments. Now, what if we wanted to have a block of code that wasn't necessarily executed or its execution was dependent on something? Well, for that, we use a conditional statement. The conditional statement has a block of code that is only executed on, you know, conditionally. And so to create this conditional statement, what we do is we say if, and then we have the circular parentheses. Now, circular parentheses always expect an argument and in this case, the argument is the clause or the conditional statement. So here I could have a variable that says const x is equal to six, pretty mathematical. And here the condition could be x is greater than 10. Now to complete the conditional statement, what we then have is the squiggly or curly parentheses and we open them up onto a new line. And whatever code is written in here is conditionally executed. So any block of, so any code in between the opening and closing squiggly parentheses is the conditional code. It's either hidden depending on whether or not this is true. If the condition is true, which in this case it's not, this block of code will not get executed. And so in this case, we could console.log, uh, console.log the string, the value was greater than 10. And we would expect this only to be logged to our console 
if the value of x was greater than 10 because that would be a true which become basically it evaluates to the boolean value true in which case this block is reached by our runtime so if i go ahead and run my code we can see that in this case this uh console.log was never executed it never showed up in here so this uh little if clause protected our code because the condition wasn't true if i were to change the x value to 11 is 11 greater than 10 that is true so we would now expect the value to be uh, greater than 10 and consequently executed now if blocks don't just have to be an if block they can be an if else block so what we can do is we can chain an else block onto the end of the if block and basically this is just for the alternate case so if the first one doesn't get executed have an else if something is true else do this so in this case here i would console.log the value was not greater than 10. so it's pretty clever it comes up in a whole lot of use cases and it's really good to be aware of now this is also a good time to jump back to our logical operators or and and now what they do is they combine conditional statements so in this case i could have a you know second condition that says okay i only want to do this if x is greater than 10 but i also only want to do it if x is less than 20. so in this case x is greater than 10 and x is less than 20. so that's an example of how we can use the and logical operator to create basically a double conditional statement one condition and the second condition so they both need to be true for this code block to be executed here so i could change this now to say the value is greater than 10 and also less than 20. and in this case this one would now become the value was not greater than 10 or it was greater than 20 because these are the conditions which would cause this first block not to be executed so in this case now if i run my code we would still expect it to show up because the value was greater than 10 and also less than 20. however if i were to change this to a 21 would that first block still be executed well the and condition the, com the, the combined condition isn't true so we would not now expect it to be executed and here we can see we got the output the value was not greater than 10 or it was greater than 20 which is the second part of the condition this is true now that's an example of the and condition the sibling logical operator is the or condition and that is the double pole character i have no idea what these are called the vertical bars the pole character and we have them together there's no space in between and instead of it being an and where both halves need to be true it's now an or which means one condition or the other is true so in this case we have x is equal to 21 so would this first code block run or would it be else to the second code block well what we would do is we would see if x is greater than 10 which it absolutely is even though it's not less than 20 because this one was true it's only one or the other it's the or operator so we would expect this first condition to be true uh, and we would change this to an or or less than 20 the value of 10 was greater than 10 or less than the value of x was greater than 10 or less than 20. So in this case if we run this code again we can see the value was greater than 10 or less than 20 and that's just an example of how we can use logical operators basically the same way as we would plus two numbers together we combine uh, conditional statements so that's a little bit about logical operators we have the or and the and logical operator where we get a conditional statement is x greater than 10 and is x less than 20 or we use the or conditional statement is x greater than 10 or is x less than 20 one or the other has to be true for this f block to be executed otherwise we get the else condition if we have no eggs purchase eggs 
Otherwise, don't purchase eggs or else don't purchase eggs. So an if else block in collaboration with these logical operators is very common. So I'll just make a note here that says C below if else block example. After that, we've got a cool little miscellaneous uh, JavaScript thing called type of. Now, let's say for a second I have a random number. Let's say that's equal to 83, 833. Now, what if I wanted to confirm that that was in fact the number data type. How would I do that in JavaScript? Well, very simply, what we can do is we can console.log random number, but that's just going to log to the console the value associated with the variable random number, which in this case is 833. But what we can do is we can use the type of command instruction in front with a space in front of the variable or just directly a data type. For example, in here I could comma separate it and have another instance of type of. In here I could have a random string. And now if I execute this, if we go ahead and run our special command, we can see here that we got type of being number for the first instance and string for the second instance right here. So it just checks the type of like essentially what data type uh, a value or a thing is inside of JavaScript. So that's just good to be aware of. If you ever need to confirm the uh, data type, you can use this little type of command. So with that done, it's time to move into loops. Now loops in programming or in JavaScript are incredibly powerful. And they're basically one of the constructs that makes computers infinitely more efficient and effective than humans. If I asked you to repeat a task a hundred times, it would be an arduous process for you. And that's totally understandable, but a computer will happily do that using a loop. I tell it to loop over a particular task a thousand times, even a million times, and it will do it like that. Now there's two main types of loops inside of JavaScript. The first one, is the simpler option, but it is probably less common and it's the while loop. So what we do is we have a while condition and like with the if clause, then we have the circular parentheses. And then after that, we have the squiggly parentheses where the squiggly parentheses contain the body of code that we want to be looped over or executed numerous times while a condition is true. So just like with the F block where the condition goes inside of the circular parentheses, the condition also goes inside these circular parentheses. So for example, here I could have let I equal to zero. I'm initializing the variable I and I'm assigning the number zero to it. And I could say while I is less than 20, that could be my condition. And every time, what's going to happen is that this loop, when we encounter it for the first time, it's going to check if i is in fact less than 20. If it's true, just like the if block, we're going to jump in here and execute this body of code. And then we're going to continue to do so while that condition is still true. Now, as I said before, loops are very powerful because they allow us to do a task, you know, countless times, but you can also run into an issue where you end up having something executed an infinite number of times, or basically your computer is going to run a task indefinitely. And this can put you in what's known as an infinite loop, and it's not a good place to be in. For example, if I just console.logged a string that said the value of i equals two, and then I comma separate it, and then I actually print the value of i, what's going to happen here if I run this, is we're going to get into an infinite loop because i, i is not changing, it is always going to be less than 20. And so our code is going to continuously run forever. We can see it's just going, it's not actually stopping. And this is where we have to use the control C command to kill our basically execution of our JavaScript file. Now, if I were to track a secondary variable, let j equal to zero, and inside here, every time we 
run a loop. We say j is equal to the previous value of j plus one. So we take the old value of j and then we add one to it and then we set that equal to the new value of j. Then what's going to happen here is every time we go through this loop, j is going to be incremented by the value of one. And that's going to, if we then console.log, the value of j is equal to, and then comma separate and have the value of j, we're really going to start to appreciate how many times we're running this loop. For example, if I re-execute it, we can see that j incremented up to 131,000 in the blink of an eye. Like, just take a second to soak that up. J literally ran, it would have kept going up to infinity, except that's just gonna eat up your computer's processing power. So we had to kill the script because it was just gonna keep going. But the point is, is that loops are incredibly powerful. Now, obviously what we would want to do is actually just have it be i is equal to the previous value of i plus one. And so now what's going to happen, and I can remove this j variable. Note we use the let declaration because the value assigned to i or j is going to be changing. We're going to be reassigning a new value. Now if I go ahead and run it, we can see right here that we executed the loop, the value of i was zero. And then because we reran the check, well actually first we incremented it, so now i is equal to one. We do the check, i is still less than 20, so we execute it again, and then it becomes two, three, four, all the way up until 19, where we would hit the value of 19. Is 19 less than 20? It absolutely is. We then print out that value, which is what's happened here. The value of i is 19. And then we add one to it, it hits 20. And then when it goes to check this while loop again, it's now going to fail that check because that condition is no longer true. And so then our code block basically carries on from that while loop. So that's super good to be aware of. However, the one, well, probably the biggest problem with a while loop is that you can just end up in these situations where if you're not careful about how you construct them, you get these infinite loops popping up. And in my opinion, the superior sibling loop is known as the for loop, and it's what we're going to cover now. And it's pretty similar. We say for, then we have the circular braces, and then we have these squiggly braces. And in here we have, this is the repeatable code, except now the for loop takes three arguments. Up here, the while loop took one argument that was a conditional statement. The for loop takes three arguments and these arguments define the constraints for the loop. So it's a more constrained loop, which means that it can't basically go wrong as easily. Now the first variable or argument that goes into the loop is we actually define a counter variable. We say for this many times execute this body of code. So that means that we need something to track how many times we've actually completed the loop. So we have a variable, I could say let j equal to zero. So j is now going to be the variable that we use to track how many times this loop has been executed. Then we have a semicolon to separate the arguments. The second argument is the condition or the actual constraint. So I'm gonna say j is less than 20. So while j is less than 20, continue executing this repeatable body of, co uh, of code. And then the last condition is the increment. Up here we saw that we had to increment the value of i. And we have to do the same thing in the for loop. So essentially what you can think about is, it's a while loop except we write out all the constraints inside the actual definition of the for loop. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say i is equal to the previous value of i plus one and actually it should be j. j is equal to the previous value of j plus one. So that's gonna go ahead and increment the value of j every time. And then down in my code block, I could console.log. I could pretty simply just do j to be fair. And now what's going to happen is we're gonna get all the values of j printing out after we've gone through all the values of i. So we didn't have to basically fumble around trying to 
get our for loop to work. It just worked pretty intuitively. Now, there's actually a cheeky syntax that you can use, a special syntax to basically write out this statement shorthand, where you just have the variable name and then you have the double plus. And this just says to increment the value of j by one. So it's just a nice little shorthand uh, to use instead of saying j is equal to the old value of j plus one. So that's a for loop, loads of for loops, you'll come across them all the time and you'll become very accustomed with them. We define the three arguments, they go within the circular braces and they are separated with the semicolon. The first one is the tracking variable to track the number of iterations of the loop completed. The second is the constraint or the condition for the loop to know when we need to exit the loop or we've completed our execution of the loop. And then the last one is, you know, the increment of plus one. Now a good example of when a loop comes in handy is if I have a uh, animals array, const animals is equal to, I could have a duck, I could have a dog, I could have a cat, I could have a Let's have a look at Peggy. So here we have an array that contains a list of four strings where each string is an animal and their comma separated. Now loops, for loops, what if I wanted to console.log all the values in the array? That's pretty easy. I can just console.log animals. And that's gonna print out all of the animals in our list. But what if I wanted to get a bit smarter and have like a special sentence print out for every single element in the list? Well now, you know, I'm gonna to have to console.log for every element in the list. And you can almost hear it there, for every element in the list, we need to repeatedly console, you know, create a, a new console.log. So that's a queue that we're gonna use a for loop. So in here I could define my for loop I could have let, let j is equal to zero. That's gonna track my counter, how many iterations I've completed. Then I need the condition. j is less than animals.length. Now, this is a special syntax in JavaScript where whenever we have an array, we can access the length of that array. We check the array and then we access the dot .length parameter or property of the array. Now that's just a syntax that's good to be aware of. The theory of that actually gets quite complex, but we're not going to really focus on it. In this case, you just need to know that it's going to return the value four because there are four elements in that array. It's a list of four items in length. So basically we're going to count up J. J is going to be zero, then it's going to be one, then it's going to be two, then it's going to be three, and then it will increment to four, at which case this will break. The condition will no longer be true and we will exit our loop. Now the last condition is going to be j++, that's the incrementer, and then in here I can have my repeatable body of code. So in this case I could say console.log the animal at index and then we can comma separate and then put in the value of j well, actually, even better, we're going to do some string concatenation. If you recall earlier, we can add strings together. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get pretty creative with how I create this new conglomerate string. What I might even do just to make it clear is actually write it on a new line. Const string to print is equal to the quotation marks. That's how we create a string. The animal at index and then we can add on a value. Now, if I add the value j to the string, it's gonna be converted to the string type and slammed on the end of the string. So we're gonna have the space, then we'll have the value of j, string concatenation, we just add them together very simply. And I can go even further, I can add another one on. So now I'm going to add the space because I'm going to need a space after j. And then I'm going to continue the sentence and have the, uh, and the value at that index is, have the semicolon again, and then I can add on animals. We access the array, 
and then I'm going to read a value. If you remember, we can read values using the square parentheses at the end of the array. And we read a value at an index. Each element in the array is located at an index that starts at the zeroth index. So this is the first entry, but it's at the zeroth index. This is the first index. Now, these are all represented by the values of j. j increments from 0 through to 3. So basically what I can do here is I can access the value or the animal at the jth index. And now what's going to happen is we have our string to print. That's a whole big string added together. So I can just console.log string to print just like that. I'm going to comment out this loop. The shorthand for doing this is command uh, and then the forward, is it the forward slash or the backslash? It's the forward slash. And that's for Mac. On Windows, it's probably uh, control plus the forward slash. And then what we do, so that's going to comment out this loop so that JavaScript at the end, um, the runtime's not going to read it. And now we're just going to execute this loop. Let's see what we get when we run this code. So now we repeated this body of code four times and we constructed a string at every index. Now the string constructed in the first index at, I, uh, at j is equal to zero. It says the animal at index zero, that's the value of j, uh, is a duck. The animal at index one is a dog. So we've used a loop to loop over every index in that array. And that's just an example of you know, how loops can be helpful to repeatedly do it, uh, a task, in this case to print out what the value at you know, each index in the array is. For loops come up all the time. They have 100 million use cases, and they're just really good to be aware of. In my modern day coding, I almost never use while loops and almost exclusively use the for loop. Now the last thing we want to touch on inside of loops is the continue and break commands. Now these are both reserved keywords inside of the loop. And essentially how they work is they, the continue keyword allows us to skip over an iteration of the loop and the break allows us to exit the loop completely. So it just says as soon as we encounter the break keyword, stop this loop, it has to end and we exit out of it. The other thing I just want to quickly cover on is something known as scope. Now this is a little bit conceptual, but here note that I initialize this variable using the const declaration. Now you might be wondering, or you might not be wondering, but earlier I said that const cannot be reassigned to. And I also said that we can only initialize a variable once. So how am I in every iteration of this loop and reinitializing this variable? Well, that comes down to something known as scope. So basically, to our body of code, this only exists for that singular iteration of the loop. So when we complete a loop, all of that is cleared, it's scrapped, it's in the trash, it's you know been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and then when we commence the next iteration of the loop, we can then reinitialize it because it's scoped specifically to this one iteration of the loop. So that's just good to be aware of. For example, if I tried to then down here outside of the loop, access the string to print, JavaScript wouldn't be able to find it because at the end of the loop, it was destroyed. It's scoped specifically to that loop. Anything in the you know top level, for example, with this animals, we've shown that we can access the value of animals inside of the loop. And that's because animals is in the global scope, which means it's accessible anywhere in our document. But because I've defined the string to print inside a scoped environment, inside a for loop, you know, every time I complete or exit the for loop, it's then destroyed and forgotten about, whereas the animals is not. So as I said before, that's just something good to be aware of. Now back to the continue and break reserved keywords. Let's say, for example, we're going to have a conditional statement. If, well, actually what I'm going to do, let's define a new variable called current animal. Current animal is equal to the animals array or the value at the jth index. 
So what I could actually do with my string is I can remove animals at j and I can just refer to it by the variable because I've saved that value to the variable current animal. So this code is starting to look pretty clear and obvious as to what it's actually doing. But what I could do now is I could say if the current animal is equal to, and just here we've also introduced a new syntax that we haven't seen before, the triple or doubles equals sign, which is used to determine equality, where the singular equals sign is used to assign a value to a variable, the double equals or the triple equals, basically the more equals you have, the stricter the equality is, is used to say, is this thing equal to this thing? So for current animal, which is the animal at the index that we may be at, I could say if it's equal to dog, and this is a conditional if statement, and then if it's true, we then enter the code inside of this if block. And in here I could throw in the word continue, which as soon as it's encountered, if our JavaScript code is going through the loop and we get to the dog index, so current animal is in fact equal to dog, then we do enter the if clause and we encounter this continue keyword, JavaScript is going to skip the loop from there. So it's not going to execute this code specifically for when the current animal is equal to dog. So if I save my code and re-execute that, we can see now that the dog index was excluded from our console.log. And that's once again because when we found, when we drew this equality and it was determined to be true, the same with the strict equality or the loose equality, either would do the trick. When that equality was determined to be true, this conditional statement evaluated to true, we entered this loop and we jumped over it. Now what I could do beneath that is have a secondary condition and this is going to be our break condition. And so I'm going to say if the current animal is equal to cat, and this time I'm using the strict equality just to demonstrate that they both function fairly equivalently. Now what I'm going to do is throw in the break keyword. So what's going to happen when we encounter the break, which should be at the second index. Remember, this is a zeroth indexing system. The zeroth index, the first index, and the second index is we're going to enter this loop because this condition evaluates to true, and we're going to break out of the loop and stop executing. So that means that Peggy will also be excluded from the output. And because this code happens before we actually print the cat line, when the value is equal to cat, that will also be excluded because we jump out of the loop just before we print the cat stuff. So in that case, the dog gets skipped over and we exit at the cat, which means we would expect only the duck to actually be executed. Now this isn't what I would consider to be a functional loop, but it demonstrates a point all we had in here was duck. That's exactly what we would expect. But those are two important keywords to be aware of when you're defining loops. And while they would work for a for loop, they would work for a while loop as well. So that's the continue and break. And now with that done, we can move on to the last section in this beginner course, which is all about functions. Now to demonstrate how the function section actually works, what I'm going to do is give you a life example of where functions come in handy. This is some software that I've developed and there are a lot of functions that go into building this platform. Now the platform is all about creating a resume, but even cooler than that, what you can do is have your cover letters written for you. So if we come in here, here's a completed cover letter where you just paste in the job posting and the functional part here is once the user has pasted in the job qualification, I then need my software to generate them a cover letter that matches their qualifications or their resume to the job description and writes the ultimate cover letter. And the user does that by pressing this generate button. Now, if I have hundreds or even thousands of users and all of them are pressing this generate button, then you can imagine every time we want to generate a cover letter, a whole lot of code has to be executed and then consequently re-executed and re-executed over and over and over again. But it only happens when this button is clicked, where basically when this button is clicked, it invokes a function. Where a function itself contains a whole lot of code 
that where in a loop we can define code that gets looped over, with a function we can define a body of code that only gets executed when the function is invoked or the button is clicked, for example. So in the case of our course, the first thing we would do is define the function. So when I was writing out my code for my software, I had to first define the function that would then later be invoked whenever a user clicked that button. Now to create a function inside of JavaScript, which as I said before, contains a body of code that basically is on call. Whenever we call for it to be executed, it gets run. We can reuse it without having to rewrite it. The first thing we do is we use the function keyword. Now the function keyword is kind of like a declaration, but it's not really, but it's a little bit like a declaration where after the function keyword, we declare the name of our function. So in this case, I could say print square. Now, just like this, that's not a function complete yet. The next thing we have to do to create our function is have the circular parentheses where the circular parentheses contain any arguments. An argument is just context for the function. So any extra values or information that we might need gets given to the function passed in in the, in the form of an input or an argument which we can then access from within the function. And just like with the if block or the while block or the for loop, now we have the curly braces, which aren't an object in this context. It's literally just defining the context for the block of code to be re-executed. So everything within those circular braces is the code that gets re-executed whenever our function is invoked. So in here, we have print square, where printing square is just going to basically square a number and then print the output. So in here I could have, uh, let's define y. Let's say we have y times by y. That's how we do a square is it's a number multiplied by itself. And at the moment, I don't actually have a number in here. I could technically have four times four. Why don't we start there and we'll just see how this works. Now that is our function complete. We have def we've given it a name. The name is fairly explicit as to what it does. If you read this, you would know that, you know, it's going to print out the square of a number. In here, what you could do is add a comment. It's a pretty common practice. If you have a pretty convoluted function, you could say, uh, give it some context. This function prints out the square of a number. And in this case, I've hard coded it to be the value of four. So we would expect the output to be 16, four times four is 16. And so if I go ahead and run this code, notice that we didn't have anything print down below where we would have expected 16 to be output, we got nothing. Now the reason we got nothing output is because as I said earlier, a function then has to be invoked where we write the function once and then whenever we need to use it, we call the function, we call on it to then go and execute that body of code. So to invoke the function, once it's defined, you then call it by its name and you use the circular parentheses to then invoke it. So now that I've invoked the function, we would then expect it to run and we can see that it did in fact print the output of 16. Now it's a pretty useless function at the moment because it just prints out 16. What if we wanted to make it more flexible? Well, as I said earlier, if we wanna give context to our function, or make it more flexible, we can give it that context via what's known as an input or an argument. So in here, we could tell it to expect an input known as Y. And in this case, whatever Y is, I then want to multiply the two Y's together and print the output. And then what happens is where I have these circular parentheses, I can then add in the value four. So what happens here is we pass in the argument four, four then gets assigned to the flexible variable y, and then we multiply it together. And in this case, we would expect 16 to be output. And indeed, 16 is output. And at this point, I would just like to point out that the log right here is pretty much a function where we pass in the arguments and the log function, we every time we call it, 
has some specific logic inside it that is used to get the output to show up inside of our console. So it's a more advanced form of a function basically. But the moral of the story is we give our function arguments, which are just placeholders for information that we can then, you know, actually define when we go and invoke the function. We can pass in multiple inputs. I could have Y and Z, and I could actually have the output be Y times Z. Now, in this case, we would probably want to rename the function because suddenly the, you know, application of the function isn't as clear. But just to demonstrate a point, I could have four and six. The uh, values get mapped to the input, so four becomes Y, six becomes Z, and we would now expect an output of 24, which is exactly what we get. So that's pretty cool, and it's an example of how we can define a function, give it some arguments, which are basically information that it can expect to receive when it's invoked, and then we can have the body of code that just gets rerun every time, you know, we call or invoke that function. And so just like that, we have learned how to define a function, which is basically an on-call body of logic that expects some input information as context and does a whole lot of stuff when you invoke the function, which is when you call it up and you get it to do what it's been programmed to do. And you can do this a thousand times. I could now write a for loop, get it to execute a million times and have it print out the square a million times. I could literally just invoke it within that for loop. That's kind of a random example. But the point is functions are incredibly helpful and there's a paradigm in, inside of JavaScript known as functional programming where essentially everything you code can be broken down into like a task or objective. And so if you wanted to write tidy code, you would just basically define a whole lot of different functions. And it's a great way of thinking where you just compartmentalize your problem into a whole lot of different problem or littler small problems and solutions. You define the solution inside of a function and then you have very neat code where everything is very functional. So to extend on our knowledge of functions, we're going to look at what is known as the return. Now in this example just here, I've defined a function and all this function does is it logs to the console the multiplication of the two numbers. Now, what if I actually wanted to create a function that gives me something back? When I call it, it leaves something behind. Because currently, when JavaScript, when the runtime executes this line, it reads this line and it does it, all that happens is that we print out 24 and then we move on to the next line and this is just gone into the ether. So that's where we introduce a concept known as return. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to define a function called add strings, just like that. And here I'm going to tell it to expect two arguments inside of these circular parentheses. So this function is going to get string one, comma separated, and string two. Now you can uh, name these arguments however you want, and whatever we pass in when we invoke the function will be assigned uh, respectively to each of these arguments. For example, I could just uh, give them variable names S1 and S2. Now, you know, I could easily say const, uh, when you add two strings together, it's known as concatenation. So we could call it concat string is equal to S1 plus S2. And then I could log to the console, the concatenated string. And now down here, I could invoke the function. I could say add strings. And I could say hello as one string inside of the uh, quotation marks. And then I could have a second string that is, you know, a space and then world. So now underneath, I could actually invoke this function again. I could have another one that says hello space comma, and then I could give it a second argument, James. So this one's going to talk to me specifically. So now when I execute this code, we're invoking the function twice. We're passing in that first argument, which gets assigned here. This one gets assigned here. They get added together 
and then we log to the console the concatenated string. So let's go ahead and run that and see what outputs. And here we can see we just output those two strings. Now back to the return concept. What if I wanted a function, and this probably is a bit too simple for a function, typically they'd be a bit more complex. Uh, but what if I wanted to actually now assign that new string to a new variable? So instead of having concat string in here, I actually have it outside of the function. I could say const new string. And I could set that equal to, you know, and then I could call the function and have a function that combines two strings and spits them out and then leaves something behind that I can then assign to my variable. If I wanted to have some logic like this, then what I need to do is return something from within the function. It's kind of like you can send a letter to someone, but if you want you know, to have an acknowledgement that the letter has been sent, you need to return something back to the user. So in this case, I'm going to return the concatenated string. Now return is a special keyword inside of JavaScript. It's used inside of functions and it does a few things. But as I said before, what's going to happen now is this function is going to get invoked. We're going to process all of the logic, all of the JavaScript inside it. And then whatever we return, so we're telling it now to return the concatenated string is essentially left in place of the executed uh, function. So we call the function, then we get to the end, we end the function, and then we leave this in the place of the function execution. So it gets returned or left behind. So now what's going to happen is this is going to get executed. We're going to concatenate or add together the two strings. And then this is uh, this value here is going to get returned in place of this. So now what I could do underneath is I could console.log new string and then comma separate that and have that um, print out just here. So now if I run my code, we can see here we have the new string and we can see that it was in fact assigned to the variable new string because we were then later able to access the value associated with the variable new string. So that's pretty hunky dory. The other thing to know about the return is I could say, if we're going to use the type of S1, so we're going to check the type of S1. And I'm going to say if it's not equal to. Now, before we learned the equality sign as the double equals or the triple equals, well, where the equality says is one thing equal to another, if we throw the exclamation in front of the double equal sign, that says is not. The exclamation is a not keyword. And it actually inverses whatever you throw it in front of. So if you throw it in front of a conditional, it inverses the conditional. So is not equal to, this is going to get the type of, that's going to return string. So this is going to say string. So I want to check if the type of is not equal to string. And then I'm going to use the or operator. Now this is getting confusing and I'll go over it in just a second, but let's just code it out together. I'm going to get the type of S2 and say is not equal to string. Then what I want to do is return uh, nothing. So this is a slightly complicated block of JavaScript, but let's just run over it once again to make sure we absolutely understand what is going on. Here we have an if block, which is some conditional logic where the logic is only run if the condition inside of the circular braces evaluates to true. Now we actually have two conditions in here. Basically the first one says if the type of S1, which is the first string argument, is not equal to a string, it's not equal to a string data type, so perhaps it's a number, perhaps it's an object, then we want to return true. Then we have the or condition, and this one checks the same thing for the second string. So what this condition is actually saying, if string one is not a string, or string two is not a string, and by the strings, I'm just referring to the arguments. So if argument one is not a string or argument two is not a string, then we just want to return. 
Now, when we return or encounter a return in the execution of our function, we exit the function. It's kind of like the break in the for loop that we learned about earlier. So return is super helpful. We can use it to exit a function immediately, or what we can do is we can actually leave something behind. We can return something from the function to remain in its place as its legacy. Now, this particular return here, if we return a blank, uh, that's often known as a guard clause because it guards the code beneath it. Now, writing guard clauses is actually really efficient code because it prevents you from doing something that's uh, known as nested if clauses. Now, nesting in JavaScript is when you have something within a version of itself. For example, you can have a nested loop, which is just a loop within a loop, or you could have a nested if clause, which is an if block that contains a subsequent if block. That's totally valid JavaScript, but, can, but it can become quite confusing. So instead what we do is we order our conditions and we just have basically one level of them. So they're all at the top level. And this is a concept that I'm just explaining. You don't really have to memorize it, but uh, it can just help to keep your code clean if you basically have uh, write them as guard clauses. So if this is true, then exit. And only if it's not true, then continue on with the code. So the return is super helpful. Uh, this is a good little conditional F block right here. And now what we can see, if I come back in here and I change this to a number, we will activate this condition because it will be a type of uh, argument one is not equal to a string, so that's true. So we activate this condition, we enter the block and we return out. So we would expect new string to be empty. And we can see that it is in fact undefined because we return an undefined uh, amount from that string. So the return is super helpful. Have a fiddle around with it. It's something that you become more accustomed with over time. Now in the same vein, we want to cover default inputs. Now what a default input is, is basically it's an input that defaults to a value when we fail to provide it as an argument. So in here, what I could do is I could actually say uh, equal to hello and equal to world. So what this has done here is we still have the argument. We're telling the function it needs to expect argument one and argument two, but if we didn't happen to provide them, for example, if I invoke the function down here, but I don't pass any arguments in, then these values will default to hello and world. So now if I run this code, we'll see that we get hello world printing out because it defaulted to this, to these values right here. If I do in fact provide them, for example, here I have, uh, James world, and then rerun this code, we would expect the defaults to be uh, negated because we do in fact provide values. So the arguments don't need to default. So in this case, James world does come out and uh, the defaults were not utilized in this instance. So that's just something good to be aware of. And the last thing we have on our list of things to cover in this course is arrow functions. Now arrow functions actually came about as a modern JavaScript syntax. And it's just a more efficient way of writing out a function. Now the arrow is an equals and a greater than sign or the little alligator sign. So that looks literally like it's an arrow that we could shoot something with. Uh, now, if we take a look at the function, the critical pieces are the input section. So the circular parentheses, parentheses just there. So I'm going to keep those. And then the secondary part is the curly braces that contain all of our logic. So here, if I have the curly braces, that is what's known as an arrow function. Now it's not very happy JavaScript right now because the last thing we have to do is assign it to a variable so we know what to call it. So in this case, I'm going to define a variable arrow function is equal to this arrow function here. And at the start of this course, I said that everything has to be a valid data type. And this is happy because a function is technically 
a valid, well, it is a valid data type. There's no technicalities about it. It is a valid data type. As for what data type it actually is, that's a little bit more complicated, but we don't need to cover that right now. We're just gonna to refer to it as a function. But this can just be a simpler way to write our functions in JavaScript. I personally, for the most part, prefer to use the syntax right here, but there are advantages to using an, uh, an arrow function. For example, I could have this be an input. Uh, I'll call this arg, A-R-G, and in here I could just have the logic where I console.log uh, arg, comma separate, and have the arg printed out. So that's a valid uh, arrow function. We could enter this down onto a new line if we wanted to. So it's kind of resemblant of the previous one. And then I can just invoke it exactly the same. And I could pass in uh, hello as a string, as the argument. And we can see that comes down here. So it works exactly the same. It's just a slightly more modern syntax for defining functions where we basically create the arrow function and then we assign the arrow function to a variable and then we can refer to it later. And just like that, we have completed the JavaScript for beginners curriculum. And if you have any questions at this point, obviously, as I said earlier, remember to leave them as an issue in the JavaScript for beginners GitHub repo linked in the description down below. And don't forget to start the course. And with that done, that draws us to the close of this beginner JavaScript course. I hope that you're feeling a bit more confident and comfortable programming in JavaScript, understanding some of the basics and foundational material. And from here, the sky is the absolute limit in terms of what you can do. If you've enjoyed the course, be sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons. Let me know in the comments down below how you felt about it. And as always, start the GitHub if you want to support the channel even more. Now, at this point, you might also be wondering what more is there to learn in the realm of JavaScript? Well, let me show you right here. I have the curriculum that we go through in my nine hour JavaScript course where you have just essentially completed chapter one of this full course that I have available. There's another nine chapters with absolutely loads of material. We go more in depth to some of the material that we've already covered. Just here, if we scroll down to the curriculum, you can check this out. This is also linked in the description down below. This is kind of what we've just done here. Then we look at developing our intermediate programming skills. Then we move into using JavaScript for web development in chapter four. There's loads of stuff there. Then we take a look at a paradigm known as object oriented programming, which is often used in things like game development, super important topic. Then we look at uh, asynchronous programming in JavaScript. And this chapter is super important if you're developing what's known as microservices. We have a lot of different independent services and you need to allow them to communicate with one another. In chapter seven, we look at modern uh, JavaScript syntax. In chapter eight, we uh, dive into some best practices in coding. And we also take a look at algorithmic programming, which is important if you're trying to get a job as a developer, answer those programming questions in the interviews. And then in chapter nine, we actually build some wicked projects. So here we can see there's five projects to develop. Number one is a compound interest calculator. Number two is an AI chatbot. Number three, we put our JavaScript into use in web development and build a functional to-do app that gets deployed to the internet. Number four, we write a custom JSON database, which is, you know, the first interaction with persisting data and how you can write your own database, which is kind of fun. And then last but not least, we develop a stock, uh, web stock data web server with express and Node.js. So this is cool. If you wanted to track stock information at any time of day, you can totally do that. So if you're looking for the ultimate JavaScript course to really take your skills to the next level, be sure to check it out. Loads of people have already gone through it. You can see there's uh, lots of great reviews. You can go through and read them if you want and, you know, see if it's the right course for you. But so far I've only had good feedback and I'm sure it would help really, you know, consolidate everything you need to know about JavaScript. Anywho, that's my little spiel. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Love the support. Hope you're enjoying the content and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace. Learning to code? If so, be sure to check out the learn to code roadmap or dive straight in with these videos. That's a good one.